You might be forgiven for thinking this is a 60s holiday camp. It's not. It's lunchtime at the government's top secret biological and chemical research centre at Porton Down in Wiltshire. At the height of the Cold War, public anxiety grew about the goings-on at Porton. In an attempt to allay public fears, this propaganda film was released. Although television and newspaper cameramen have spent many hours in MRE, they almost always only represent the work carried out here by this. Yet this glossy image hides a sinister tale of secrecy at the highest levels of power. The West was being used as a vast testing ground for Porton's biological warfare research program. It's, I think, inconceivable that that would be done now, but times were very different then. I think that the, 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 the Cold War was, was, was very much uh, in people's minds, and the, the, there was a concern that the UK was, the UK was um, particularly vulnerable to uh, a germ warfare attack from an aeroplane going down the coast or from a, a ship offshore. And they, they really wanted to understand something about how the bacteria spread and what the, what the extent of the threat was. And was it just going to be a people in a very small area or would, in fact, people over the whole of the south of England be potentially at risk of being infected with a, with a germ warfare agent? A huge test program was carried out by Porton Down scientists, sanctioned by government. One series was carried out in the 1960s off the Dorset coast near Weymouth. Two types of bacteria were sprayed from a modified ship, the ice whale. One, known as Bacillus globigii, or BG, simulated anthrax. The other was E. coli. If you got close to the ship, you'd be able to see the mist, but, but away from it, you wouldn't be able to see at all. The spraying was done always at night, because otherwise the sunlight would have killed the E. coli. Uh, the BG was in spore form, so the sunlight wouldn't kill that. It, it was That was almost sort of armour-plated. Um, so all the attacks, and that's what they were, they were simulated attacks, occurred at night. Of course, the state in a democracy is meant to serve the people rather than the people serve the state. Uh, and we have more democratic political culture now that allows the kind of questions that you're asking uh, to be asked. And when there's no transparency, when there's no accountability, then people in these situations find it very tempting to abuse their power and simply assume that they know best. It's pretty obvious that we do need to know um, how to defend the country. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I do have a problem with experiments being carried out in public areas, without public knowledge, with no independent safety oversight. As the 60s ended, Porton Down's testing programme became more ambitious and spread from sea to air. After they'd um, done the experiments of the large-scale releases from the ice whale, they, they wanted to scale those up and they had a Canberra bomber which they, they, they modified so it would hold very large amounts of bacteria, up to about a thousand gallons, and would spray that from the aeroplane as it, as it flew low across uh, part of the UK. Throughout 1967, the dual-purpose bomber used as its target RAF Tarrant Rushton in Dorset. Yet the bacteria being sprayed would have been carried some 50 miles on the wind towards Somerset. I don't think they were any different from the experiments from the ice world because they were using the same bacteria, the E. coli, mixed with the Bacillus globigii, and the amounts that were released were similar to the, the amounts um, from the ice whale, although they did intend from the documents to, 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 to build up to, to, to larger releases. In the late 90s, Professor Brian Spratt, now based at Imperial College in London, was asked by the Defence Ministry to independently review the potential health implications of spreading bacteria over populated areas. Well, I was really looking at the experiments from about the, the early 60s through to the mid 70s, and I, I was given access to all of the, the scientific reports um, that had been released under the 30-year rule, and a couple of documents which were still at that time classified, um, which were the sort of the, 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 the basic laboratory report, internal laboratory reports about these experiments that were carried out uh, in the south of England, spraying the bacteria across the, the Dorset coast, and, and a few other experiments that were carried out. The report focused on all trials carried out by Porton Down from the 60s to the mid-70s, 
It concluded that on the whole the tests were safe, although it did add that some people suffering from chronic illness could have been infected. These people would have been unaware of the secret military activities in the area. Nobody knew about these, these but these were very secret, and so certainly if there had been a small cluster of cases of, of, of pneumonia, uh, for example, then they certainly wouldn't have been picked up because everyone gets pneumonia, well not everyone, but pneumonia is a relatively common disease and so doctors would not, I think, have, have known that anything odd was going on. So that's, I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things, that these, these releases were done on a public that were completely uh, unwittingly exposed to these agents and something I think we wouldn't contemplate doing, the MOD wouldn't contemplate doing now, but at the time uh, it was considered to be justified. Justified or not, the report did highlight some concerns over safety. It stated that four of the trials were even more risky. There were a couple of batches which had a rather higher level of contamination and they, they, was, they were still used. They were put into mice, they didn't kill the mice, and so the contamination was not thought to be important. I, I, I did think it was slightly odd that they did decide to spray um, those particular suspensions, given they had a, a significant level of contamination with bacteria that weren't very well characterised. Recently, ITV West obtained previously classified documents from the Public Records Office. These detailed six secret trials carried out in 1968. Although this time was covered by Professor Spratt's report, he says he had no knowledge of them before we showed him the documents. Was he, like the public, being kept in the dark? I'm surprised to hear that because I did try and get hold of all the documents and I think if the MOD is going to go to all the trouble of having an independent report, they, they should show me all the documents. I think just to try and sort of hide them and, 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 and not even tell me of their existence I, I think is, 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 is not a very sensible way to behave. The papers relate to a unique set of tests which were different because they served no scientific purpose. Porton's intention was purely to show off its capabilities to representatives of the armed forces. As a public relations exercise, live bacteria were again sprayed across Dorset. By the early 70s, scientists at Porton Down had begun discussions with the Americans about sharing their expertise on biological warfare. The UK had the technology to tell what germs were being used in an attack, while the Americans could detect their approach. At the time, the only other people in the Western world or other NATO countries that were working on, on such a project were the Americans, and they had two very good systems. So the chiefs of staff somehow managed to persuade the Americans to come over here and collaborate. The 1971 details, uh, we were told uh, quite a few years ago, and they did produce a document, Field Trial Report Number 12, which showed trials procedures uh, trials results weren't mentioned too much in there. Um, there was even, we found out recently, a press release prepared um, should members of the public have found out that this was occurring in 1971. But in there, there was a slight lie was told. I've got to call it a lie because that's what it was. And they said that no live bacteria were sprayed at all, where in fact we know that they, they did spray BG live. And here's the proof. The draft press release approved by the Under Secretary of State for the Army. It stated that the spray used a harmless aerosol cloud of killed bacteria to simulate such material. What definitely wasn't for public gaze was this top secret document. It says one element of the trials involved viable or live bacteria. These joint trials with the Americans took place in November 1971. Four years later, Uncle Sam returned. The latter trials, 1975, the DICE trials, uh, Professor Spratt wasn't told that these trials existed. Uh, 24 experiments were conducted with a, yet again a ship spraying bacteria. Uh, this time they strapped a Land Rover to the ship because they didn't have the ice well to be able to use, so the Land Rover provided the spraying equipment. They set up the detection systems at Portland Bill in an Admiralty underwater weapons establishment. And uh, it was a very successful operation. Well, you've shown me some documents which I've, I've, I've not seen. And as, uh, as far as I, I remember, and, and looking at my report, 
the most of the experiments and reports that I saw from 1972, 3, 4, 5 were either testing equipment or protection of buildings or decontamination of personnel carried out at Port and Down, or they were testing the vulnerability of ships out at sea. I've not seen any experiments from 1975 which were releases over public areas. And I think I should have seen them or been told about them. We asked Porton Down why it had failed to give Professor Spratt details of the trials in 1968 and 1975. ITV West had to supply the centre's press office with details of the 1968 tests. It has since told us the trials were safe and it hadn't withheld documents. So how have things changed over the last 30 years? In part two, we look at how the recent anthrax attacks in America sparked a new round of tests in the UK in what some see as a return to Cold War paranoia. During the Cold War, the UK braced itself for attack from its communist enemy, the Soviet Union. Levels of paranoia were high. People were living in constant fear of what might happen. Scientists at Porton Downs Research Centre in Wiltshire embarked on numerous biological and chemical trials in a bid to be ready for what many thought would be World War III. Today, the threat has changed. It now comes from terrorist organizations rather than from nation states. The government is still fighting a propaganda war. Only this year, booklets were delivered to every household in the country, advising of what to do in an emergency. In terms of the, the probability of being killed by a terrorist with a biological weapon, it's almost infinitesimally small. Let's put it this way, if you think there's useful information on that leaflet uh, about how to protect yourself, then the most dangerous thing you could do is cross the road to get that leaflet, because the probability of being killed by a car while doing so are vastly, vastly higher. It's, it's just extremely unlikely that, that such a threat could, could be acted upon. And it does raise the question, why then is the government delivering these leaflets? Partly, it's just covering itself. There's an element of saying, well, if an attack does happen of any kind, and it's unlikely to be a biological one, then they can say, well, we, we did something. No one can say we did nothing and didn't prepare. But how prepared are we? Emergency services carried out a mock chemical attack in Birmingham a few months ago. 2,000 volunteers took part. Had they been victims of a genuine attack, they'd probably be dead. The emergency services took four hours to treat them and conceded that lessons must be learnt. So are we seeing a return to Cold War paranoia? Is there really a threat, or is it simply government spin? Governments gain politically from atmospheres of fear and paranoia by external threats, and I'm not saying they're doing this deliberately to stir people up, but that is the effect of it. Uh, people start to think, oh, if it's this scary and dangerous, then we, we'd better trust the government, we'd better hand power to the government, we'd better stop questioning the government. Uh, maybe they do know best. Whether it knows best or not, one thing that is clear is that the government today is scrutinised more than it's ever been by the population at large. Three years ago, following a spate of anthrax incidents in the United States, London suffered its first alert at the stock exchange. Thirteen people were taken to hospital following the scare, which turned out to be a false alarm. These incidents have demonstrated that the contingency plans that have been developed by frontline emergency services, both within the NHS and the police too, are effective and can be deployed rapidly. 
This prompted action here by the Royal Mail in 2001. One of the UK newspapers reported that the Health and Safety Laboratory were conducting tests in sorting offices using live bacteria to simulate an anthrax attack. They would simulate by using BG, anthrax spores being sent through the mail. The sorting offices worked as normal. Um, all the post office workers were informed and informed consent was obtained from them. Uh, and obviously, as the sorting offices worked normally, the mail that everyone received would have had a small amount of BG on it. The purpose of the test was to measure how the Postal Service would cope in the event of a terrorist attack. The Communication Workers Union, which represents the interests of postal workers, is worried about the contingency plans in place to protect employees and the public. Because of what happened, the 9-11 also the tax in the postal system in America, that there's a lot of systems that have been put into place and we've been putting pressure on the employee in regards to making sure that our workforce are safe and obviously more importantly the general public are safe. But that, taking that into context, we're also very, very concerned that because of the pressure within Royal Mail, with the workload, etc., that we believe that some local managers, if there is a suspect package, would put it to one side and our members and the workforce would have to carry on working. And we've had some instances in the last two years where that, that's actually taken place. Obviously we've got some concerns in regards to the systems that have been put into place because in May of last year there was a suspect package delivered to the union office, the regional office, and it met all the criteria of a suspect package where there was no postage paid, it was bulky, and it met all the criteria about it, it should have been pulled out of its source, and yet it went through a mail centre and delivery office and actually turned up at a point of delivery. Subsequently it was then passed to the police and I've been informed by fellow colleagues that there was no systems in place by the Avon and Somerset Police to deal with that. I believe that's subsequently now changed, but it does show that although there are agreements and documents and safe systems of work put in place, that obviously from May of this year that still is not necessarily the case. Horton Down declined to comment on its involvement in the post office tests, saying it would not be prudent to give specific details of when and how its expertise is used. However, documents we've seen show it did assist the Health and Safety Laboratory. Royal Mail says security measures are in place. Although postal workers involved in the tests gave their consent, some question whether they were really aware of the simulant being used. The difference in, in in this experiment, to pass experiments, is that the post office workers did give their informed consent. They were told this is BG. Whether they were told how safe it was, I don't know. Whether they were told whether it caused food poisoning, I don't know. At the height of Portendown's Cold War research, servicemen asked to volunteer for tests say they were kept in ignorance. In 1953, a 20-year-old airman, Ronald Madison, died shortly after coming into contact with the nerve gas sarin. He and hundreds of others had gone to Porton, thinking they were helping research into a cure for the common cold. Some thought they were taking part in physiological tests. I was told it was a common cold research, and so I volunteered. Uh, I was a medic. I was working in a, an RAF hospital. I thought that uh, common cold research was a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, and there were two other incentives, which obviously were, were, were worthwhile at the time. They offered an extra two shillings a day, which seems ludicrous by today's standards. And, of course, a weekend pass, a chance to get home and see the girlfriend. A second inquest into Madison's death has just concluded, over 50 years since he died. It recorded a verdict of unlawful killing. Those veterans who survived today, including ex-serviceman Ken Earl, claim their health has been affected by the tests carried out at Porton Down. In my early 30s, I was diagnosed as having ankylosing spondylitis, which is a, uh, uh, an affliction of the spine. I have two areas of my spine that are seized up. Generally, I think that, that, that the uh, experiment with sarin has affected my nervous and immune system. I think today people are more aware of biological warfare. In the past it was always sort of a, a scary thing that was kept out of the way because nuclear um, annihilation was, was probably more on people's minds than, than biological warfare.
nowadays because we know that biological warfare is cheap people are more educated we understand it, it's cheap um it, it's easier to do i'm not going to say it's easy to do but it's easier to do than say nuclear warfare or even chemical warfare um it is on people's minds yes but it's always been there that danger has always been there well i think the the the, the threat of the very large release the that the hundreds of gallons um, from an airplane probably is um, pretty low um, because that that was very much the nation state that was the, the Russia particularly producing huge huge amounts of, of of many BW agents. We're now talking very much more about about small releases. I I don't know how you evaluate a risk. I think there is a risk. I think it's probably over exaggerated in America. I suspect the 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 risks here are are judged in in a, in a slightly more rational and, and and calm way than in the states. I think there is a risk. Um, I wouldn't like to say what the risk was, but I think the risk is mainly of, of fairly small-scale releases of, of, of some of these uh, some of these BW agents. Whatever the risk today, those in power have changed the way they deal with secret documents. As we've seen from papers released after 30 years, what goes on behind closed doors is often very different from what the public is told. Actually, one of the recent innovations uh, in government has been post-it notes. These are regarded as incredibly valuable by those in government because you can have the document, you can stick a post-it on, and the job of the person who receives the document is to read the post-it and bin it. Porton Down continues to contribute to the defence of Britain today, just as it did during the Cold War. We'll have to wait 30 years before getting any clue as to what it's involved in now. No one would argue against the need for a degree of secrecy, but how much access should the public have to information about the workings of the state? In the interest of national security, for you and for me, it is necessary to keep a small amount of MRE's defence work secret. No work is undertaken on the development of munitions for the spreading of diseases. The research is limited to that necessary to enable an effective means of defence to be devised.